As David sang, he sang a song that says, Jesus is coming. And Jesus is coming. Randy spoke of Jesus coming. And we want to talk about Jesus coming today. I passed over 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 and following, which I thought I would preach today, but Mike preached it last week. Therefore, we will just go on to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians was written quickly after 1 Thessalonians was written. It seemed that the people there in Thessalonica had a problem with understanding the coming of the Lord. So Paul writes this letter to talk about the coming of the Lord. In chapter 2, he'll talk about that. But because they seem to think the Lord was coming quickly, they seem to have stopped their labor and were idle. So he'll deal with that, deal with that in chapter 3. And he'll let us know that those that are idle are to be disciplined. They're not to be tolerated. But in today's lesson, we want to talk about the first chapter. The first chapter of 2 Thessalonians. And he'll talk about the judgment day. He will talk about the coming of Jesus. He will talk about the end of those that persecuted the brethren. He will talk about the end of those that are persecuted. So as Craig read for us in verse 1 and 2, he speaks about the senders and the receivers. In verse 3, he talks about the thanksgiving for their faith and love. And we will begin in verse 4. The righteous judgment of God. The righteous judgment of God. He says in verse 4 there, he says, So that we glory in you, in the churches of God, for the patience and faith of your, in all your suffering and affliction, which you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. And to the end that you be encountered worthy of the, God, the kingdom of God, whereunto you suffer. These brethren are suffering. They're suffering terrible persecutions. They're suffering afflictions. And they're taking it patiently and in faith. He says, I glory in you. Paul's not saying that he is glorying in himself nor what he did. Because he already told us in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, I am what I am by the grace of God. And that grace was not given to me in vain, for I labored more than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that works in me. Paul says he's not glorying in himself. He's glorying in what God does through God's people. It is God that does all the work. It's the grace of God that we are here. It's the grace of God that we live. It's by the grace of God we do everything we do. And he speak about he glories in them. Amongst all the churches of the brethren, he brags about what God has done through the brethren there in Thessalonica. Because it's God that does it all. In Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21, he says, Now the God of peace who raised again from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep with the blood of an eternal covenant make you perfect in every good will to do his will. Working in us that which well pleasing in him through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. He said, these people doing what they're doing, they're doing it because they've yielded themselves to God. He says they did this with patience. With patience. That's the bearing up under difficult situations. They're bearing up under all these persecutions. And they take it patiently. 
and go forward serving God. From the first letter that he wrote to the Thessalonian brethren, in chapter 1, verse 3, he'll say, remembering without ceasing, your work of faith, your labor and love, and your patience and hope in the Lord Jesus. That's the patience of hope that gives them the hope of eternal life because judgment day is coming. And we are assured because of Christ's sacrifice, those that are in Christ have the hope of eternal life. It'll be a great day for us. They take that with patience. They take persecution and affliction. He talked about their persecution from the very beginning. These people are being persecuted. He says in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, in verse 6, he said, you become imitators of us and the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. They received it with affliction. They were always under persecution. He goes on to say, with joy in the Holy Spirit. Again, in chapter 2, he mentions their persecution. He says, and ye, brethren, become imitators of the churches of God in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you suffered the same things of your own countrymen, even as they also did of the Jews. And he's so concerned about their, their suffering and the, and the effect it has on him that in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he sends Timothy to check on them to see how they're doing. And then when he gets, this, gets there to see how they're doing, Paul says he did that because in verse 3, chapter 3, verse 3, that none of you be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that herein too were you appointed. We're appointed for these afflictions. He says in verse 4, for verily when we were with you, we were telling you that we are to suffer afflictions. That may be the reason for what he says in chapter 4, verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians, where they're talking about they're in, they're in sorrow because some of their brethren have died and they think they've missed the opportunity. They've died before the Lord came back. So Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, we would not have you ignorant brethren, Concerning those that fall asleep, that you sorrow not, even as the rest who have no hope. We don't lose our hope in Christ when we lay this fleshly body down. That's, our, that's the day of glory. And he says on in verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God to the end that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer. God's judgment is righteous. God does everything by righteousness. This judgment is evidence of the righteousness of God. When we live in this life, we don't see a lot of righteousness taking place. There's a lot of injustice going on. It seems in this life that the wicked triumph. There's a day coming when everything will be made right. It will be just. The wickedness that goes on in the world around us is allowed by a sovereign God. Our God is sovereign. Jesus says he has all authority in heaven and on earth. There's nothing that takes place that our Lord doesn't do or doesn't allow and he allows that to take place because he is long-suffering, not willing that any perish. He wants them all to come to salvation and the knowledge of the truth. That's the reason he is long-suffering. Plus the fact, in all of our persecution and all of our trials and affliction, it is for the purpose of growing us. We talked about that last summer. <laughs> When we talked about 1 Thessalonians 2 and 3. But that day will show everybody, the whole world, that God reigns. It is all of God. He says, to the end that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Worthiness. 
this affliction is so that they will be counted worthy as well as maturing them and showing the world that Christians don't yield under the wickedness that takes place in this world. That we have a hope, that we don't lose our hope, and that we bear the weight and continue on to prove our righteousness, to prove our worthiness to inherit God's kingdom. In 1 Peter 1, if you start in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he begat us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ unto an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved for you in heaven, who by the power of God are guarded through your faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. Because of that, verse 6 says, therefore we rejoice greatly. But that's not the end of the verse. We rejoice greatly though now. For a little while, if needs be, you are put to manifold griefs and manifold trials that the proving of your faith which is more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tri- that is tested with fire, may be come forth in honor and praise and glory in the day and the revelation of Jesus Christ. It proves our faith so that we're worthy to re- inherit the kingdom of God. Our Lord Jesus and our Father gave everything Everything that they could possibly give other than just making us robots and forcing us to be obedient. They did everything. And whatever we can give, whatever we suffer, it's just a minute thing compared to what God did for us. He'll go on in 1 Peter, in chapter 4, in verse 12, he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is amongst you that cometh upon you to prove you that a strange thing has happened. But inasmuch as you're partakers of the sufferings of Christ, rejoice that at the revelation of His glory, we shall rejoice with exceeding joy. That day for those in Christ will be an exceedingly glorious day. Counted worthy throughout the Throughout the New Testament, it speaks of the necessity of God's people being counted worthy. In 1 Thessalonians 2.12, he says to walk worthy of God. In this passage here, in verse 11, chapter 1 here, he'll tell you to walk worthy of your calling. Ephesians 4.1, Peter says to walk worthily of the calling wherein you were called. In Philippians 1, 27, he says that you would walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are called to walk worthy because that day of judgment is coming. Four to six, four to nine, excuse me, six to nine, speaks of the righteous judgment of God. That judgment will bring terrible destruction to evil people and those that are persecuting God's people. He says, if so be that it's a righteous thing with God to recompense affliction to you that are afflicted. And to you that are afflicted, rest with us at the revelation of Jesus from heaven with the angels of his power in flaming fire, rendering vengeance to those that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall suffer punishment, even eternal destruction, from the face of the Lord and the glory of his might. Destruction is coming to those outside of Christ. If so be, it's a righteous thing with God. It's a righteous thing. I've said before, the word that's translated righteous And righteousness is a forensic term. 
It's a term for the courts. It's a term, it is always a decision of the judge. There will be a decision of the judge. He is the righteous judge. And that righteous judge judges according to his standard. That standard never changes. It's a standard of righteousness, and God will judge by that standard. You hear people say they're just so glad they'll be judged by a merciful and gracious God. No, they won't. They will not be judged by a merciful or a gracious God. They'll be judged by a just God. All of God's mercy, all of God's grace was poured out in Jesus Christ on that cross. He paid every price. He appeased the wrath of God for us. He he atoned for our sins. He gave us everything. And all of the mercy and the grace is in Jesus Christ. And because of that, on that day, justice will be brought forth. And we will stand before the judging God, who God, who judges according to total righteousness. And he'll say, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the eternal kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Because standing there hidden in Jesus, we are just as righteous and just as holy as Jesus is. And that's a just judgment. But for those outside of Christ, there'll be no mercy. There'll be no grace in that day. In that day, it's a righteous thing with God to recompense affliction to those that afflict you. Recompense means to give back. What they've been doing to the Christians and persecuting them and doing evil things is all going to come right back on them. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, from chapter 4, 13, he starts talking about judgment day. And in chapter 5, he talks about the coming of the Lord will be like a thief in the night. And in verse 3, he says, speaking of those outside of Christ, when they're saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes on, on them. As the tribulation of a woman with child, and they shall in no wise escape. Sudden destruction is coming upon them. And this is coming. God will recompense affliction. It's God that does it, not man. Man does not need to retaliate. God says all justice is going to be taken care of. In Romans 12, 19, he says, Avenge not yourself, beloved, but give place to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. He is the one that pays back. And he says in verse 7, And to you that are afflicted, rest with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven, with the angels of his power in flaming fire. He's coming, that coming, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the last day, the judgment day. That's the same day he spoke of. A while ago we spoke of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, where he speaks about those who have fallen asleep. But he says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an angel, and the trump, and the trump of God. The dead in Christ will raise first, then those of us that remain that are alive at his coming shall together with them be caught up in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And there shall we ever be with him. We receive great glory in that day. But the wicked receive a terrible punishment. These angels are coming In his power in flaming fire. This passage just says the angels are coming with him. But if you read in Matthew 25, starting in verse 31 down through 46, it's a judgment scene. And he says in verse 31, And the Lord shall come with all of his angels and sit on the throne of his glory. And all the nation will be brought before him. He'll separate them one from another as a shepherd ship separates the sheep from the goats. 
That's a great judgment day. But that tells us he's coming with all of his angels. How many angels does he have? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but I know Revelation 5.11 tells us that the number of them, speaking of the angels, that the number of them is 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You've got 100 million, not even counting the thousands and thousands. And Isaiah 37, 36 tells us the angel of Jehovah went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. One night, one angel. And there came, and they are coming in flaming fire, rendering vengeance to two groups those that know not God. And those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because those that know not God, they have no excuse. Because the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament is handiwork. Romans 1 tells us that they have no excuse. Paul starts in verse 18. And he says, For the wrath of God has been revealed against all ungodliness... The unrighteousness of men who hindered the truth and unrighteousness. For what is known of God is manifest in them, for God manifested unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived through the things that are made, even his everlasting power and divinity, that they may be without excuse." There is no excuse for not knowing God. God revealed himself from the creation. He says there'll be no excuse in that day. But if you read on in verse 21, when they knowing God glorified him not as God, neither gave him thanks. They became vain in their reason and their senseless hearts were hardened. They professing themselves to be wise became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God to the image and the likeness of corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and crawling things. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of the flesh, to vow passions, to a reprobate mind. Because they refuse to know God. But not only those that don't know God. But those who do not, do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a multitude. There's a world out here. There's a world out here that claims a belief in Jesus and a belief in God. But they don't obey the gospel. 1 Peter 4, 17 Tells us, for the time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what shall be the end of those that obey not the gospel of God? Terrible end coming upon them. When that end comes, they're going to bow. Philippians 2, 10 and 11 or Romans 14, 11. Every knee shall bow. The things in heaven, the things on the earth, things under the earth, that every tongue shall confess Christ Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. Every knee. All these people that refuse to reject Jesus. All the atheists, all the agnostics, all the, all the isms of all the world. Going to fall down on their face before Jesus Christ and confess him as the God of this universe. The creator. The one that died for everybody. Did everything so they could be saved. They're going to know the ignorance of their life. And they'll be ushered straight into the flames of fire that comes with the angels. Because the day that Jesus comes... That judgment day, that is the day that time ends and eternity begins. All repentance, all obedience has to be done in the, time, in the realm of time. Because when Jesus comes with the shout of an angel, the trump of God, time ceases. 
and what men are then, that's what they're going to be eternally. There is no more time. It's a state of being. And he tells you in Romans 2, verse 9, uh, 8, I think. But unto them that are factious, that obey not the truth, but obey unrighteousness, shall be wrath and indignation, tribulation and affliction to the soul of every man that worketh evil. The day is coming. It may come before we leave this assembly. We don't know when it's coming. And he says, goes on to say, these shall suffer punishment, even eternal destruction from the face of the Lord and the glory of his might. Eternal destruction. He says, back in Matthew 25, where we were from 31 to 46, talking about the judgment day. He said in 34, enter ye, blessed of the Father. But in 41, he says, depart from me. Ye cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He goes on down to verse 46, the last verse of that chapter, and he says, These, the evil people, shall go away into eternal punishment, the righteous, unto eternal life. Jude 7 says that. Even as Sodom and, Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah and the villages around them in like manner gave themselves to fornication and strange flesh was set forth as an example, suffering the punishment of an eternal fire. Judgment day is coming. They're cut off from the face of the Lord and the glory of his might. Everything that is any value is cut off from them. Ten to twelve. The glory of the righteous in Christ. What a fantastic day that'll be. He says when he comes to be glorified in the saints, to be marveled at. In all them that believe, because our testimony to you was believed in that day. He says, they're going to be glorified. Jesus be glorified. We live here on this earth to glorify Jesus. That's the reason of our creation. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, he tells about the work of God before the foundation. He says in verse 6, unto the praise of the glory of his grace. He talks in 7 down through 12 about the work of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 12, under the praise of his glory. 13 and 14, he talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. Unto the praise of his glory, he ends up in verse 14. We're here unto the praise of his glory. Chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 20, 21. Now unto him who can do exceedingly abundantly of all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him. Be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. That day, that day, our eyes will be open and we will see the glory. We can't even imagine the glory of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They are glory. That day, We'll be glorified. We will glorify Jesus. We will be marveling at his appearance. We will stand in such awestruck marveling at him. We will shout in joy. Eternity belongs to us. It is us for what it has done. And Paul says in verse 11, to which end we also pray for you. That you may be counted worthy, worthy again, worthy of the kingdom of God. <coughs> fulfilling all desires of goodness and works of faith with power. All desires of goodness. He prays that we would do that so that that day when Jesus comes, we will be those that glorify 
and those that marveled at the coming of Jesus. Not those that are saying, peace and safety, then sudden destruction. They shall in no wise escape. Judgment is coming. He ends the chapter that in the name of Jesus, that the name of Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Judgment day is coming. Paul tells them. We're still waiting for that day. But that day may be immediately, we don't know. And as long as we're in this realm of time, we have the opportunity to yield ourselves to the God that loved us enough to kill his son so that he could redeem us back to him. He calls us, he does everything good for us. And he pleads with us and he begs with us, come, be saved. Don't let your pride, what was anything else on there? Yeah. Don't let your pride stand in the way. Don't let anything stand in your way. There's nothing, nothing, as Randy mentioned what James said about a child having, having a quarter and thinks he has money. He doesn't have anything that adults know he has. Everything that we have on this earth here is nothing. All the possessions we think are something are nothing. Even our life physically is nothing. It's just passing by. But eternity is just that. It's eternal. All decisions must be made now. So the church pleads with you. Jesus pleads with you. God pleads with you. Don't any, let anything stand in your way. If you need to come to the Lord today, come today. Don't wait till tomorrow. If you've fallen away and need to come back, come back to the Lord. Make everything right. Because the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an angel, and the trump of God. And time ceases right then. Everything has to be done now. If you need to do anything to make that right, we'll sing a song. And you can come forward and make your, ne your needs known. Stand and sing.